Welcome to Trinity Radio. I'm so glad you're here. And we are living in a world today that is filled with drama. There's a lot of drama going on in the world right now, obviously, with the pandemic and the elections and all the things that have happened recently. There's a lot of online drama. There's a lot of church drama and there's a lot of family drama. In this video, we're going to take a look at how God ensures that his plan will succeed even when family drama is at its worst. Now, that includes, by the way, when it's at its worst sexually. And so I want to warn anyone listening that this entry in this series includes descriptions of sexual acts and relationships that perhaps children or those easily triggered by these things shouldn't hear. Um, the only thing I'll say by way of application here is that it should encourage us that though our desire should be to always seek to do what God wants us to do and to serve the Lord faithfully, this is not a cop-out, but it's good to know that though our disobedience can lead to much suffering and problems in our own lives. God's ultimate plan, God's ultimate goal will not be thwarted by our drama and the drama that we uh, in, get involved in. Now, it's not clear exactly when in the narrative of the story. So for those that don't know, this is in a series on the book of Genesis, and we're in chapter 38 starting today. And this is it's unclear exactly where this story goes in the narrative flow. We've just heard the story of Joseph's, Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers, and uh, we're later going to pick up the story with Joseph in Egypt. But at this point, it's, it's unclear exactly where this goes. Now, there's indication in the text in verse 1 of chapter 38, it says, and it came about at that time that Judah, and then it goes along with the story. But how we're to understand at that time is difficult when you get into um, the, uh, the, the amount of time that it would take Judah to accomplish these things that are discussed in this chapter. It may well be that some of these things started during uh, the period when they first came into this land uh, before the events of the previous chapter. So it may not be exactly chronological. Uh, just keep that in mind. One thing to note about this chapter is, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, why is this here? Why is it interrupting the story of Joseph? And, and just to give us this very bizarre story, frankly, about one of the sons of Jacob that will become one of the tribes of Israel, namely Judah. Well, uh, it may be difficult for others to figure this out, and there are certainly no shortage of possible explanations for this. But for those of us who are Christians, it makes a lot of sense because the reason that the uh, story is here, or one good reason, is not only does it give us information that is related to uh, uh, people and places that have to do with uh, King David, who is in the line of Judah. Uh, many of the characters in this story are connected to David in some way. Um, but also Jesus, because Jesus comes out of Judah. So this is all pretty important to what we're doing here, to, 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 especially for those of us who are Christians. Judah is important because it, the Messiah is going to come out of Judah. So all pretty interesting when you, when you start this off. Also, all of the places named in this chapter fall within the tribal territories of J later Judah. So keep that in mind. All right, so let's begin with chapter 38, verse 1. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. Now, you'll remember in the story of David, which obviously takes place later on than where we are chronologically in the Bible. But in the story of David, when he's on the run from King Saul, he hides in the cave of Adullam. And that cave existed in, this, in, in the region of the Adolamites. The city of Adullam was in the Judean lowlands. So again, you're seeing there... Uh, these are peoples that are relevant to Judean territories, but also related to the story of David in some indirect way. Uh, verse 2, Judah saw there a daughter of certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her as a wife and had relations with her. And she conceived and gave birth to a son, and he named him Ur. And she conceived again and gave birth to a son, and she named him Onan. She gave birth to yet another son and named him Shelah, and it was at Chezib that she gave birth to him. Now, Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now, this has been a lengthy period of time. Uh, it would have had to have been. This is just a few verses. But notice that just in these few verses, a lot happens in Judah's life. Um, he's had time to find a wife. And who knows how long that took. It might not have taken very long. Could have taken quite a while. 
He's had three sons, and now he's finding a wife for the oldest of those sons. Now think about that. So um, the oldest son, what was his age when he's looking for a wife? Well, culturally speaking, it could have been anywhere from 13 on up. Um, but the earliest this could have been then to find a wife, have three sons, and now have be looking for a wife for this son. We're probably looking at something like 16 years minimum, 15, 16 years, something like that, uh, of period, a period of time covered by just these few verses. Verse 7, But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Now, it doesn't come across to us, but in the original language, um, the term for evil and the term and the name Ur, there's like a word play there that's kind of interesting. But, um, but, but God took his life. Now, we don't know how he died, but in some way, God took his life. He did something evil. So it's important when we're trying to figure out, like, okay, how old was he and how much time has elapsed? Uh, it it's probably I mean, this we would assume that we can't be dogmatic about it. But we would assume that the kid is older than 13 or 14 years old, because for him to have a reputation of being a wicked man, uh, we wouldn't think he had done enough by 13 or 14. Maybe maybe he was a real problem child. But um, to be 13 or 14 years old and already have the reputation of being so wicked that he's deserving of divine punishment of immediate death, uh, we would think that he's older than that. Um, but however he died, it was God that took his life. Uh, because he was such a, a wicked, wicked man. All right, verse eight. Then Judah said to Onan, have relations with your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up a child for your brother. Now, that sounds weird that uh, that once he's dead, this wicked man, that his brother would then take his wife and, and have children with her. If you're not familiar with how this stuff goes in ancient societies and in the Bible, that might sound very strange to you. But actually, this was referred to as this is referred to as Leverite marriage. And uh, it's actually outlined in the law in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. Now, that comes obviously chronologically after this point in the story, but apparently it was already customary in the story. Um, the Israelites uh, had this not only for whatever reasons were, it was probably already a custom, but they had their own important reasons, which has to do with the keeping of the land and in the right families and in the right tribes and all those kind of things. I'll just go ahead and read from Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, because this Leverite marriage thing is super interesting and kind of funny. And I'm sure I've already talked about it in the Genesis series, but uh, but, but I find it kind of humorous, um, even though it reflects sad realities. Uh, verse 5 of Deuteronomy 25 says, When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall have relations with her and take her to himself as his wife. So it's important you're not just going to sleep with her. You need to. She needs to be full-fledged wife in Israel. And perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall then be that the firstborn to whom she gives birth shall assume the name of his father's deceased brother so that his name will not be wiped out from Israel. And again, that's not only important just for the propagation of his family and the maintenance of these tribes, but also the properties that these tribes uh, represent. Um, verse 7, But if the man does not desire to take his brother's widow, then his brother's widow shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He is not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's widow. Now, now notice that I want you to really listen to this. This is this is the funny part. He, so if, if he doesn't want to do this, if he doesn't want to take her as a wife and bear a child in his brother's name. Um, this is what's supposed to happen. Um. She, she's supposed to, uh, so my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He's not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Verse 8, then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's widow shall come up to him in the sight of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. <laughs> and she shall declare, this is what is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And it doesn't, it could be that, that just the spitting in the sandal is, is what is meant by this is what is done to the man who won't build up his brother's house. But this shows up actually 
elsewhere and this idea that this should be done and and we don't what exactly should be done some scholars think that there was some sort of a uh, physical indication like you might maybe something like this this shall be done to the brother you know something something visible like that that doesn't come through in the text this is what is to be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And in Israel, his family shall be called by the name, the house of him whose sandal was removed. And that would be a great shame in an honor shame culture. You don't want to be known as, you don't want your household known as the house of him whose sandal was removed, do you? Of course not. So that's Levite marriage. So the, the idea was that, uh, that it was shameful not to do this for your uh your deceased brother to marry his wife and have children in his name. Now, th- what, another thing that's interesting, this occurred to me, I'd never heard anybody else talk about this, but when I was studying this a few years ago, it occurred to me, we always hear people say, um, well, you know, polygamy, let's, let's say polygamy is never endorsed by the Bible. Now, obviously the law of Moses regulates for it so that if it occurs, here's how it's supposed to go. Um, and we obviously see polygamy in the Bible, but it, it but it, oftentimes preachers and Christian apologists and Bible teachers will say, but nowhere in the Bible does it actually um, mandate or encourage or speak positively of uh, polygamy. And I think that that's probably true. I still think that's probably correct. However, this when I, when I'm dragging my comb through script my comb through Scripture to try and find anywhere where that might where, where it might be the case, where it is endorsed in some measure. Uh, Deuteronomy 25, the Levite law, is wh- the only place where my comb gets hung up a little bit. And it's because here, <laughs> if, I mean, you got to understand, most of these men would, would be married at marrying age. And if their brother dies and, the, and he has a wife, and now this wife is to be his wife, well, now he's got two wives. So it seems like if he does the honorable thing here, now he's in a polygamous relationship. That seems to be recommended in general. Okay, now, I was actually talking to um, to another friend of mine who you would know on YouTube, very well known Bible teacher on YouTube, and uh, I was talking to him about this, and he said, um, he said, well, I don't necessarily think so because he said it may well be that, uh, and, and technically this is this is possible. He said it may well be that uh, that actually what's what's going on here is um, if a man was not already married. He could marry his brother's wife. And if he was married, he could refuse and just provide for that woman or whatever um, or, or or something like that. And maybe the the ceremony with the sandal and all that would happen, but not happen in an aggressive way. And we have examples of that happening, ha- of, of the, the Levite marriage uh, ceremony happening and not in an aggressive way elsewhere. So maybe. I don't know, but just taken as it is, it, it, it sits a little awkwardly with, I just think it should be at least a footnote when people say the Bible nowhere, anywhere, um, gives any indication that it should ever be done because it, someone reading this on their own might not come to that recognition that, um, well, maybe, maybe you could just do the ceremony and, and, and it'd be all right. It doesn't have to be this shameful thing given certain circumstances like marrying this woman would create a polygamous situation. I don't know. But it doesn't really matter so much for the story we're looking at today. I just thought I'd cover that because I think it's interesting um, and not completely irrelevant to the text that we're dealing with. So the idea is in verse 8, Judah said to Onan in Genesis 38 here, um, in verse 8 it says, Then Judah said to Onan, Have relations with your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up a child for your brother. That this is because of the Leverite sort of thing that would become law later, but was apparently already a custom. Okay, verse 9. Now Onan knew that the child would not be his. Now now buckle your seatbelt here because this is about to get pretty racy pretty quick. Onan knew that the child would not be his, so when he had relations with his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground so that he would not give a child to his brother. Now, in case your imagination is disallowing you to understand what's going on here. Basically, sexually, he withdrew from intercourse in time that he would that his seed would not be uh, would not impregnate uh, Tamar here. So that's what's going on. Um, so now he didn't want to give, but the thing here is he didn't want to give a child to his brother. 
And it may well have been that he was thinking here, my brother was such a wicked man. Why in the world would I want to give him a child in his name so that his name goes on? It's better that he just stays dead and has no offspring to bear his name. Or maybe it's just, he's just an evil person too, just like his brother was. Um, uh, uh, that, that could well be it, and he was just acting selfishly. Uh, but what he did, verse 10 says, was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. God took his life also. Now this is going to lead to kind of a funny conclusion on Judah's part. Wouldn't have been funny to anybody in the story, but as a reader, um, it's, it's a little funny, but we're going to get there in a moment. But now, here's the thing about this passage. So when you're looking for application, and this is an interesting chapter to try to find any application. For anyone today wishing to make a biblical case that birth control is wrong in the sight of God, this is about the most explicit example that they think they can get. The question is, is it really an example of God not being happy with any form of birth control? Of course, the problem is that you, you're not going to find too much in the Bible on the subject of birth control because the people in these cultures in biblical times, throughout biblical history, are people who uh, wanted to have children, and this was seen as a good thing and not a thing to be avoided at all. You see instances where people are grieved because they're having difficulty having children. But you're not going to find many situations where there's discussion about someone trying to prevent having children. And so you land on a passage like this, and this is about all you've got, something like this, to try and make your case that God is... Uh, that, that God is upset and upset enough by birth control that he's actually going to take someone's life. I mean, if a man preventing conception resulted in divine judgment, that seems to speak pretty sternly about the issue, right? Now, that's all well and good. But whether or not God is actually against birth control in all cases, I don't think this story serves as evidence for that conclusion. Um, it's It's because... It's not just that a man prevented conception. That's not all that's going on here. It's that a man prevented conception in order to avoid familial obligations regarding the production of offspring for his brother. That's the problem. And actually, there may be a deeper problem that perhaps we might add to that crime, the crime of using his brother's wife for personal pleasure and nothing more when something more was the whole point of the arrangement. Now, for, for married couples... Uh, the pleasures of sex are a good thing. That's something that God clearly intended. And I don't, I, I think one is got a total uphill battle to argue that there's something wrong with sexual pleasure and enjoying one another's bodies in a marriage relationship. That's a perfectly acceptable biblical idea. Um, but if, but, but that's partly because you're not treating them as just an object that is a person who you have made a serious commitment to and you have an arrangement with. You've pledged your life and all your possessions to him and to her. And that's that's I mean, that there is a self-sacrificial recognition that um, that we're all in together. This is not just you're not just an object for my pleasure. Well, part of the arrangement of this marriage was that she would become pregnant and a child would be provided for this dead brother in his name. That was a part of the whole setup. Well, he's just treating her as an object and, and ignoring that part of the setup. So it, I don't think one can make a case that birth control is in principle a bad thing in God's eyes on the basis of this text, because the thing that got this man killed was not just that he prevented um, pregnancy, uh, but it was actually that he did this in a circumstance where it was all a ruse. He was supposed to do this to fulfill his obligations. And perhaps now he's treated this woman merely as a sexual object, which is also wrong because she's much more than that made in the image of God. Now, uh, when it comes to birth control, you might wonder though, uh, is, is it sinful to, um, to prevent pregnancy, to engage in some sort of <clears throat> birth control? I don't think so. I don't think the cases that I've heard for that are strong. It may well be that God views it that way, but I think the more important question is, for what reason, because this is what gets to the heart issue, for what reason is it that you are seeking birth control? Uh, that'll get you more to the heart of this thing. If you're seeking birth control because you want to be involved in sexual promiscuity with people you're not married to, 
with no ramifications or less of a chance of ramifications, well, that's not a good heart reason. That's that's you're in sin, right? Um, if if you are doing it because you just have no interest in what whether God might want that or you've not even considered whether God might want children for you, well, then I think that's probably not right either. Um, what's the reason why you're preventing this? Uh, there may be good reasons. Now, I, I'll tell you. Um, I, I hope I'm not sharing too much personal information, but I think I already have in this series in the early chapters of Genesis with be fruitful and multiply. But um, I, I personally have taken measures uh, that there have been surgical measures taken with respect to me. Let's just say it that way. So that um, medically speaking, it is very, very unlikely that I will produce any more children. And I have two daughters who I love. And um, I mean, I'm absolutely pleased not to have any more children. However, I got somewhat convicted years ago listening to Steve Gregg um, lecturing on these issues because uh, while he agrees that there's nothing in principle wrong with uh, contraception, the idea or with birth control, let's say that uh, uh, to be more ambiguous, <laughs> there are some forms of contraception that I think are in principle wicked. Like if they cause the termination of a fertilized egg, I think that's a problem. But, um, but, but because you know, the Bible does describe children as um, military devices. They are like arrows that you fire at the enemy uh, that you have. Now, obviously not physical combat, but they are, you know, they're a part of your spiritual warfare. You raise up these children and you fire them out onto the world, onto the enemy territory um, as arrows to impact the world for the things of God, for the kingdom of God. And so if that's, if that's how the Bible describes children and your relationship to them, then why would a man or a woman to minimize the number of arrows they have to fire on the enemy? That makes a certain amount of sense to me. And so I actually got a little bit convicted about person. You know, I'm not saying that somebody needs to have 14 children or something. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that for me personally, as a matter of personal conviction, I'm convicted that uh, that I took that measure when I wasn't entirely certain that was the right measure for us to take. Um, interestingly, uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I've just turned 40, but, but a few months ago when I was still 39, I actually encountered a man who's a pastor in our area and somewhat charismatic. And we were talking about this very issue. And he said, brother, I've got a word from the Lord. And I said, what's that? And he said, you're supposed to have more kids. And I said, well, I, it's, it's probably not going to happen. And he said, no, 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 it can be reversed. And you need to go have it reversed. This is as clear to me as anything. God has given me a word for you that you're to have that reversed. And you and your, and your wife are supposed to have a child. And, um, and so I thought, well, I, I don't think that's right, but, uh, but I do have this conviction that maybe I made the wrong decision. So I thought I'll go talk to Sarah and see what she thinks. So I went home to my wife and I told her what I thought about that. And she said, sweetheart, we're both almost 40. And I said, yeah. And she said, uh, I, he's going to have to give that word directly to me and it's going to have to be postmarked heaven. And so this is probably not going to happen. But the, the point is, this is a matter that I have tried to take seriously and feel that I didn't take seriously enough at a previous time. And perhaps you should take it seriously, depending on where you are in life. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, verse 11, then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I am afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Now this, this gets a little funny, okay? I don't know if you catch what's going on here. But the first brother died because he's a wicked man. Then the next guy marries her. He dies because of this whole thing about uh, enacting in a primitive form of birth control. Or I guess I should say a natural form of birth control that is unnatural, but more natural. Right. Uh, but Judah doesn't know why these guys are dead, apparently. And so what Judah is has decided must be the case or might be the case is this woman is cursed and anyone who marries her for some reason or other dies. We don't know, but maybe he's thinking something like, well, I, it's this Canaanite stuff, you know, but anyway, he's, he's afraid. Okay. If I marry Shelah off to her now, 
he may die too. So what he tells her is, he's like, look, you just remain a widow in your father's house for right now. Now, this means that she is betrothed. And so to sleep with anyone else would be a form of adultery, culturally speaking, in their day. But he says, so you just, so he doesn't know what to do. So he says, you, you just, you just stay in your father's house. Shayla is too young. When he gets older, you know, then, then, then we'll see. Then you can marry him is the assumption. But he's thinking, I am afraid that he too may die like his brother. So he's, he's kind of biding his time to figure something out. So verse uh, 11 says, Tamar went and um, lived in her father's house. So this is kind of funny. Uh, verse 12 says, Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. And Tamar was told, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So now li listen to this. She removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up and she had not been given to him as a wife. So at this point, she's figured out that she's not going to be married to Shelah. That seems clear and she's running out of options. So she's figured it out and she's OK, what am I supposed to do now? I'm attached to this family. I can't go off and marry anyone else, but there's no one else in this family. And they're not going to marry me off to the guy who is in this family who I could marry. So she comes up with this really gritty plan to get ready. Because if you thought it was already uh, perhaps a R-rated story, then, then here we go. Verse 15, <clears throat> when Judah saw her, he assumed she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Here now, let me have relations with you. For he did not know what she, that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may have relations with me? He said, Therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She then said, Will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, What pledge shall I give? And she said, you, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. Now, these items would have been identifiable to anyone who saw them as specific to Judah. You're familiar with seals, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a second. But the idea is these are not things that she would be able to, um, that, that in the presence of anyone else, uh, she would be able to deny. These are obviously... Um, Judah's property. So if she could produce these later, it would prove that she had been with Judah. Um, so what about this seal? Because uh, you might be thinking of a, 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 like a, and it, it's not dissimilar, like a seal on a ring, like, like a signet ring. And some of the translations say signet that you would like put into wax for a letter or something. And, and it would give your engraving or something. Well, um, a, this is from the, uh, the Faith Life commentary. Uh, this was likely a cylinder seal. A cylinder seal is a small oval-shaped object upon which a personal sign or name was engraved. When rolled over clay, so this cylinder it had an engraving on it, you'd roll it over clay, an impression was created. They were often hollowed out in the center, which enabled them to be carried on a cord around the neck. Tens of thousands of cylinder seals are known from archaeological excavations. So that would explain the um, the seal, and then the the cord is probably probably held the the signet seal, and then the what what about the staff? The Hebrew word used here for this is mata, and can mean either staff or scepter. Depending on the context, mata can serve as a symbol of leadership or royal power, as in Isaiah fourteen five or Psalm one ten two, or Numbers seventeen two, and notes that tribal leaders in Israel had their own staff. Uh, no, no, number 17, two notes that tribal leaders in Israel had their own staff. Judah's staff was likely personalized in some way. So you could have like, you know, if you're going to carry a staff around all the time and it's going to be a part of the typical furniture of sorts that, uh, that you carry as an accessory, then you might carve it in a unique way and, and really go high fashion with it. You know, it, maybe it has an animal head uh, designed onto the top of it. Maybe if I had one, I'd have my dog, Indiana, have his head on top or. Who knows? 
And so the idea, though, again, is that with these things in her possession, she would then later be able to prove where she got these from, that these were that she was with Judah. So he gave them to her and had relations with her and she conceived by him. Verse 19. Then she got up and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garments. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adullamite, to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the people of her place, saying, Where is the temple prostitute who was by the road at Enam? But they said, There has been no temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the people of that place said, There has been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, Let her keep them. Otherwise, we will become a laughingstock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. So, you know, a couple of things. First of all, we're going to, I want to talk about this temple prostitute business. But first of all, um, this, you know, if you're able to talk publicly about, hey, where is that prostitute that's been floating around here? And if it's clear that you, you're trying to supply her with some sort of sort of payment with a goat, this is not this is apparently something that was acceptable, an acceptable part of culture. And we're going to see why in just a few moments with the cultural context here. Well, then why would Judah be worried that if he investigates this further after he can't find her, why, why is he afraid that he'll be a laughing stock? Well, it, it could well be that it's simply because uh, there are certain things even in our society today that are not technically illegal. And you could ask about them in, a, in if you're an unknown person in a particular city, but you wouldn't want your closest friends and neighbors to know. <laughs> you wouldn't want it to be public knowledge, right, that you were involved in certain things. Um, and so the, it, perhaps it's something like that. But this brings us to this question of about temple prostitutes. What it, not all translations mention that it's temple prostitute. What's what's going on there in verses 15 through 23? Well, the Canaanite culture, this is from um, the uh, IVP Bible background commentary of the Old Testament. There's one for the New Testament, too. I always encourage you to have both of those. Um, it says about this, the Canaanite culture utilized cult prostitution as a way of promoting fertility. Devotees of the mother goddess Ishtar or Anat would reside at or near shrines and would dress in a veil as the symbolic bride of the god Baal or El. Men would visit the shrine and use the services of the cult prostitutes prior to planting their fields or during other important seasons, such as shearing or the period of uh, lambing. In this way, they gave honor to the gods and reenacted the divine marriage in an attempt to ensure fertility and prosperity for their fields and herds. Now, obviously, this sounds <clears throat> primitive and uh, the sexual side of it sounds um, crass and immoral. And indeed, it was. Uh, but putting that aside, fertility worship in general seems to be a pretty common thing in world history from various cultures. And it's not surprising that someone would come to the conclusion that this is a basic idea that deserves recognition. It's not correct. Um, what's correct is the understanding that there is something higher that deserves to be worshipped, um, that in some way controls creation. But that is, but that is of course, recognized in the Christian God, right? But fertility cultures in general, if, if you're out here in some place and you're trying to figure out something about the world and how the world functions. And, and if there is this natural inclination that we humans seem to be wired up to think of the divine, I believe that, then uh, it, it's not that crazy if you're trying to come up. I mean, it sounds crazy to us, but it's not that out there if you're just trying to figure it out on your own to think, OK, well, um, fertility seems really important, right? Um, and it seems to rain down from heaven and then crops grow. And this is uh, sort of mirrored in humanity with the sexual union. So maybe uh, this God or gods that are blessing or cursing us, if things go well or go bad, are interested in fertility. That seems to be the main thing. And so we'll honor them appropriately with fertility practices of some sort. Um, obviously, that's false, but it's not surprising that one would come to that conclusion, barred any other revelation. Of course, uh, Romans, one of the favorite verses I always quote on this uh, on this channel is Romans chapter one, verse 20. The invisible things of God's eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen 
so that they were without excuse. You, you should, whatever your thoughts are, you should at least recognize there's one maker God who made everything. Uh, but anyway, uh, so th these temples sprung up and part of the fertility worship would be you had these devoted temple prostitutes so that when men come to shear their sheep and do all these things, they would engage in um, with the temple prostitutes in a sexual union as part of their worship. Uh, as bizarre and um, immoral as that is, there's some explanation of how this idea emerged. So, uh, but back to the story, he can't find this, this Adolamite friend can't find her and comes back to, comes back to Judah. And in other words, this was a business transaction and uh, Judah's thinking I reasonably tried to live up to my end of the arrangement, but she disappeared and that's it. And as for me and my stuff, I'll just get other stuff. She can just keep it. That's fine. Verse 24. Now, it was about three months later that Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has prostituted herself, and behold, she is also pregnant by prostitution. Now, that is, Judah's not aware of what happened to him, that she was a prostitute for him. And as others have pointed out, some of the translations say she played the prostitute, and you might think that means she played the part of a prostitute, and now he understands what happened. No, played the prostitute is just an idiom for she acted like a prostitute. She acted like a harlot. He's unaware. All he knows is she's, she's prostituted herself. Um, your daughter-in-law Tamar has prostituted herself and behold, she's also pregnant by prostitution. Then Judah said, bring her out and have her burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent word to her father-in-law saying, I am pregnant by the man to whom these things belong. She also said, please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. And Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. Uh, and Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. And he did not have relations with her again. It came about at that time, at the time, well, actually, before we get into this thing about the twins, um, uh, this is... It, it, let me say this delicately. There is the sin of adultery and there's the sin of fornication. And these are two different sins. Okay. Um, adultery is typically understood to be uh, sexual immorality in which one or both parties involved are married. Fornication is sexual immorality where the participants are not married. And so uh, when it comes to adultery, which you might think, well, she's not married. Well, but if she's betrothed into the, in this family to the next son, even if Judah's not wanting to marry her off, she's still technically committing adultery. And the penalties for that are, are steep, whereas with fornication, it's a different story. So while we recognize that both these things are sins and we're not in the business of wanting to rate these two sins differently ourselves, the fact is, uh, or maybe you do, but, but the fact is, uh, culturally speaking, he's committed a lesser sin than she has by the thinking of the day because she was uh, she was in adultery and and he was not. Um, now, uh, but but anyway, he he sees this now and he thinks of himself as having committed uh, a worse sin. It says in verse 26, Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I since I did not give her to my son Sheila. This is kind of like him saying, in some way, this is all my fault because I wouldn't marry her off to my son, Shelah. Strange story. Because remember, again, why didn't he want to marry her off to Shelah? Because people that marry her tend to die. I mean, this whole thing is weird. Okay, verse 27. It came about at the time she was giving birth that, behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth that one baby put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. So as a way to keep track, you know, of, of which baby is the firstborn. Well, a hand came out, so they tied a ribbon around that and said, this, this is the one. But it, came to pass, but it came about as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out. Then she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. Now, breach there, you shouldn't think of in term, the way we understand a breach, pregnancy. But anyway, he, he broke through. He came out first. Afterward, his brother came out, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, 
and he was named Zerah. Now, this seems unlikely, and so perhaps there is some sovereign control in this story, some providence of God interacting to, um, to, to make this happen a certain way. It seems like this is something God is doing. I, I don't want to get too poetic or metaphorical with this, but the child that human beings tied off as the firstborn was pushed out of the way, and the real firstborn, or the ultimate firstborn, broke through. This is a thoroughly biblical theme of uh, who man chooses versus who God chooses. The Israelites would later choose Saul and sort of tie him off, so to speak, as the right choice. But God would raise up a David who no one saw coming. He broke through. And here, that's particularly important because Judah is the line of kings and the Messianic line. So you see why I say that a family that messed up just about as bad as a family can possibly mess up still couldn't, couldn't thwart God's plan. In fact, God's plan to bring about David and nonetheless the Messiah through this lineage. And uh, the drama of this family didn't mess up God's plan, not one bit. He's in control. So the only application that I might make, well, a couple of things. First of all, remember that this story, it's interesting that this is included because this is the line from which the Messiah would come. And it's a very odd thing to, that, it, that this would just be included right here after we've already seemingly begun the story of Joseph. Um, but it does come. And of course, we as Christians see significance in that. But also, uh, though we should always be striving to live the way God wants us to live, let's remember that he is ultimately in control and there's peace in that that we're going to mess up and we're going to make mistakes despite our best efforts. But here's a family that messed up about as badly as you can mess up. And guess what? God still took their sinful actions and worked through it to bring about his desired result. And with that, I'll see you next time on Trinity Radio.